mythicist movement has moved on. There was a time when I first started to write and people used to say, you're, you're an idiot. Nobody thinks that Jesus never existed. Everybody knows he existed. You can't say that. And they used to tell me what I could and couldn't say. But in the end, of course, the number of people who were agreeing with me grew and grew. There are writers in most countries now who write on the topic of Jesus and do demolish this figure as an historical character. And I would say it's not a difficult thing to prove, not beyond all shadow of a doubt. We're not that precise about such historical things, but certainly in any reasonable manner. It's a question of how reasonable is it to believe this son of God ever existed? Is there any real evidence? I'd say there isn't, and I'm quite happy to discuss it at length with anybody. But is the subject even of interest? I have gained some satisfaction now in, in seeing and following the decline in belief in the Christian religion. It dwindles away. I mean, the last little headline that I put on my website was the fact fewer Christians now than since the Dark Ages. That is where we've got to in the sense that people, have they been convinced of the argument about Jesus or have they just switched off about religion? I mean, I would say I don't mind either which way. At least they're not following a rather silly superstition. Yes, there are followers of Jesus. We have the happy clappies in various shades of belief. It probably gives them some satisfaction, gives them a place to go, an occasion to meet friends and all kinds of benefits. And I'd have to say, in the context of the UK, religion doesn't really trouble me nearly as much as certain other things that happen. It's really the cause of our social and political life now. It's not really about religion. There is a difference, of course, if we focus on America, and probably 80% of, the, of my books have sold in America. That is where the real debate over Jesus is fought. They have various movements and enthusiasms for Jesus that were just unknown in this country that would make most of us blink. So I'm happy to allow things to go on as they are, because there are many younger writers now of, of treading the same path, just joining the dots and say, hang on, folks, this doesn't make much sense. But that's it for the UK. I'm, I'm happy with that. One might even say that some Christians might be allies to humanists on occasions. I don't know what the, the, this group has ever done in terms of social welfare or charity work, but it, it's possible to cooperate with people, even if they have in their head some manifestly silly ideas. Well, they don't have to be the ones that you're talking about or dealing with, and you can cooperate with them. So I'm happy with that. So where do we go from here in the sense of this group? This is where I say I need a little bit of feedback from you, because if we have somebody here who is absolutely convinced Jesus was alive and well, I'd like to know about it, because I'd, I'd like to hear the arguments that, you, that influence you, because it's so easy for me to conclude as your humanist, and I'd, I'd prefer the word atheist, we probably don't have a lot of empathy with that particular idea, but I may be wrong. So do shout if anyone is a believer. Jeff and drive the by the response. Right. OK. So uh, hang on. Uh, sorry. I, I, I just I just comment that, as I understand it from Wikipedia, um, a lot of people who study uh, religion of the view that it's probable there was somebody called Jesus completely separate question was whether or not one believes that he was the son of God. Okay, good point. Good point. That is a wiki. That is the Wikipedia position. Yeah. About Wikipedia. When I first started to write, I of course consulted Wikipedia very extensively and, and, and read the, the articles that they have on this uh, Jesus Christ. And I, in my innocence, I thought, okay, I'll add some bits to that. And, and make points that may change people's minds. I found I couldn't, right? I found I couldn't. Jesus, as a subject, 
was reserved. It was reserved, it had been written, and nobody, but nobody, can make any adjustments to it. And if you want the backstory to that, it's because there is and has been for some considerable time a Christian vigilante group, which in the early days formed a, a collective of writers to provide evidence for Wikipedia so that people would read the official Christian story and it would be endorsed by Wikipedia. Now, you might say that's unfair. The justification that Wikipedia gives is we are not patronising or supporting novel ideas. We support official, orthodox, conservative ideas. That's where we're at. So you cannot, you cannot change Wikipedia. You can write other web pages by all means, of course, but there is this dead hand which has been endorsed by the church they got in very early as you certainly know two things monopolized the internet when it became available only one of them was pornography the other one was the christian religion so there it was established and it's very difficult for a somebody who has a contrary view to to actually get get any leverage in it into that but particular department okay it would be interesting to know what other people's views are but I was, it was simply this if it can be shown to a, a sufficiently persuasive degree that or a, rather a, a very persuasive argument can be made to the effect that Jesus never existed does that actually have the effect of nullifying Christianity as a whole if only because a belief in the Jesus existence is so fundamental it's 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 the foundational basis for the religion yeah good point i'd really be interested at least in some kind of summary of your position in terms of of jesus and proving i mean i don't think there's any doubt about the son of god issue but but whether you can actually prove that jesus as a human being never existed i'd be very interested in and at least you summarising your yeah, findings. Sure. Summarise my question in the chat, but I'm basically asking this: if it can be shown right. or if it if it is if it if it is definitively the case that Jesus never existed, leave aside the question of whether he was or was not the sign of God, but whether there was a a, a human being that existed over two thousand years ago by the name of Jesus. If it can be shown that such a person never existed, does that have the effect of ultimately nullifying Christianity as a whole? I would say no. Christianity will keep going, whatever. It will evolve a ideology which says the earlier belief in a man was necessary as part of God's plan so that we could all come to God. So they will finesse their, their position entirely so that they can accept that, well, there's no actual man, but we believe now what we were meant to believe because it was God's intention. So I think they had a survival strategy. It's very clear up front how much it would affect people. I don't know, because many people have a very simplistic interpretation of Christianity. They think of Jesus as a nice man. Nice man, right? And they also think it says nice things. Love one another. Who's going to object to that? Love one another. So they, on a very flimsy basis, they can justify their faith, whatever. And if you point out any of the vast crimes and injustices that have been, would have been perpetrated by the church, well, it's a shrug. It's a shrug. It wasn't us. They were bad Christians. They weren't even Christians. We've got to be the good Christians. So inquisitions, witch hunts, all the rest of it can be dismissed because they just come into the current. And I think I'm a nice person and I think Jesus was a nice person. And if I believe in him, I'm going to live in, live in heaven forever. As rationalists, we're never going to convince a level of idiocy that cis and humanity if people want these stories they will have these stories does it, it doesn't matter if someone believes something really strange and weird I suppose the answer is depends whether it hurts somebody else if it doesn't I suppose we can dismiss somebody living next door or 
or, or down the road or what have you, so long as they don't get up to mischief. Of course, a lot of people who wear the cloth of, of, of Jesus uh, do get up to mischief in, in a major way. So it, we, we have to stay vigilant. So that's how I feel about it. I'm pleased, as I say, that there are younger people now um, picking up the, the banner, as it were. We will see how it develops. We'll see how it develops. I mean, there are always issues that bring religion back into the floor. Uh, I mean, if you had too many uh, tr- uh, terrible things happen in the world, when I suppose that you could have a resurgence of religion. Who knows which way it will move? Certainly, Islam seems to lack no energy in terms of its younger enthusiasts, but it, it seems to be a little bit absent in Christians, as far as I can see. Gerard, you had a third point. I was. It was. It was just. I, I'd be really interested in some of the work that you've done. Ah, yeah. Sorry, the summary. To, yes. To, you know, to to actually prove that Jesus did not exist. I, I was. I'm just interested in that. I, I agree that you know, I mean, the Son of God thing is so preposterous. If if people want to believe in fairy tales, then fine. But but I am interested in any research that you've done to clearly prove that Jesus as a man did not exist, and all of the people who followed him uh, yes. didn't didn't yeah. exist. Yeah. It's an interesting logical problem, really, pr- proving the negative, proving the negative, proving this guy didn't exist, you know, because he could always exist and he just lived secretly and never saw anybody and, and stayed in a cave and the rest of it. So he could it still exist, couldn't he? Except that how do you build a real world religion on someone who didn't exist? So you, so there's a, it's not entirely solved that way. One of the words mentioned earlier by Wikipedia saying that the comment, most scholars in the field, and bear in mind most scholars who write about Jesus are Christians, but anyway, most scholars in the field use the word probably. It's a very handy word, very handy word in Jesus studies because you can really get, get a long way by saying, oh, I think he probably existed. And everyone thinks how reasonable you are. How reasonable you are, it's a very rational way, probably existed. In fact, I used to think he probably existed. The only criteria I needed to think he probably existed is I never studied him. You just hear, you hear the name, you hear it a little bit in school and the rest of it. Well, he probably existed. Why wouldn't he? You know, what was he? Uh, he you obviously, as you say, you dismiss the, uh, the rather fantastical claims, but you think, well, it was probably a guy. Why wouldn't there be a guy? So, so actually... Hammering down this, we can prove he didn't exist, is in an absolute sense probably impossible. Can't prove it to that extent, but who needs to prove it to that extent? It's this thing, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm reminded of that thing that uh, was said, yeah, who, who said it about a, a teapot in orbit around Jupiter. Who, who was that? Arthur C. Russell, Russell, Russell's teapot, I think, Bertrand. Yeah. Oh, Bertrand Russell. Yeah, I mean, OK, some things you can't prove, but you just, it's as close as nothing to, 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 to be possible. Yeah, the thing about Jesus, if he existed, we'd need some trace that he existed. And it's trying to find the trace of a real person as opposed to some fantasy that people have then ascribed to a real person. That is what becomes, that is a real difficulty. Yes, at the end of the day, anybody can say he probably existed. Man just lived quietly in Nazareth and what have you. You know, you could, you could say that. But people like us who think about these things, that isn't quite good enough. We should be able to say more than we can do. Now, let's come back. You said about the evidence. So let's come to some of the stuff that uh, you know, I've presented and have presented many times, for example. You just take the simple thing of where do we get this story of Jesus from? There aren't multiple sources. We can't go to a a, a Roman historian. We can't go to a a Jewish historian, a Greek historian. We can't look up what do they say about the life of Jesus because none of them, none of them write about him. I'm allowed for those odd little, odd little references lost lost in the sea of, of writings. But but basically. There is no testimony from others. The only source is, of course, the Gospels. 
the Gospels. That uh, provides all the source we, we, we have. Yeah, okay. Now, is that good enough for you? That is the real question. Is that good enough for you? Mark, Matthew, Luke and John, right? Say things about the baby Jesus, the adult Jesus. And is the fact that it is written in those documents, in those early testimonies, is that good enough for you? It's ra rather like using the Daily Mail as your source of information, isn't it? Can you rely upon it? It's written in print, but is it reliable? The thing about these these four characters who are ascribed to the Gospels is that we don't know who on earth they are. We don't know who on earth they are. The, the names were ascribed to them at the end of the second century, but the, before that, what existed was it's in some form of anonymous document. And so there's a that, that, that is, in a sense, it begins to as I would say, a, be a red flag as to where these stories come from. Four unnamed authors that we don't know where they wrote or when they wrote. So we have a story that emerges, a story that emerges, not a story told by you know, a famous Roman historian like Tacitus or somebody. No, they emerge and they are sort of found, as it were, within the Christian community in the second century. So they, they, they find them. Now, the funny thing is, they don't even agree with each other. We have four sources of the story. No two of them are the same. They overlap, they overlap, but they don't actually agree in primary things. Now, that would be troubling. That would be also another red flag. Why are these documents so obscure in their origin and why do they overlap so outrageously, contradict each other so outrageously? So that is a troubling thing. Now, if we put together how they, the, the New Testament is, was, was assembled, and you can, you know, there are many, many books on how, the, how we got the New Testament, and nearly all writers agree that Mark was the first gospel, okay? Mark was the first gospel. I don't have a, any problem with that. It's the simplest of the gospels. It's the shortest of the gospels. It's the gospel doesn't begin with any nativity. Mark's gospel begins with Jesus arriving on the scene as a man. That's how he begins, fully grown man. And he goes along to baptism ceremony, by John the Baptist. So that's where he, in, he comes into the scene. Mark's gospel ends early as well. Mark's gospel ends with the women frightened and leaving the tomb and telling no one. There is no post-resurrection appearances. There's, they, the, the story ends with the women told no one. So it obviously raises the question, if they told no one, how does anyone know the story? Yeah? Those sort of errors... You could understand in a simple story drawn up at a time when the purpose of the gospel was to give hope and expectations of something better to a people that had been decimated by a, a terrible war. They had been wiped out by the Romans. The rebellion had wrecked the whole economy and the uh, temple, temple structure of, of the Jewish state. Um, and here was something written by not a fisherman but a smart enough guy to write a tale that gave people hope uh, for something better now whatever he intended it to be it didn't stay that it, be, it moved on to development first of all by Matthew and secondly but by Luke Matthew starts to bring in more more wondrous elements more miracles more instant actions he builds up Jesus from merely a man who was adopted by God of baptism. He builds him up into, ah, something special. He was born special. And so here is another bit of the story. And so you see the, the miracle elements coming in. And when it gets into the hands of Luke, which I'd say is another 15, 20 years later, he says, right, let's try and base this in history. Let's put it in her history. 
So his primary source is Josephus, the major Jewish historian at the time, that the Christians used a lot to build up their story. And, and so they, they built up the fact that, that it was the 14th year of Augustus and, and, and so on, and Jesus was born and the nativity story comes in and so on. And they try and tries to put it into a historical context. And so the story comes together and eventually this, the, the, the Gospel of John gets laid on top of it as, as a more interpretive version of the same story, but they're all slightly contradictory. Now, what I'm saying, coming back to the original point, given this is this construction, why on earth would we imagine this is the biography of some real man when it's so patently been manufactured for a social purpose? Is it likely that Jesus did precisely those things that are told or that somebody else has gone to the Old Testament and thought, Jesus needs to do a healing miracle. We'll write in a healing miracle. And so one fits very clearly with the other. And throughout this construction process, this is what has happened. Stories which had their origin, not in a real historical event, but in some a scriptural precedent, become the basis of a story about Jesus. And not only that, there is nothing else. There are no incidental stories that are not part of that. There are no incidental, there's no time when Jesus just reminisces or something about something in his earlier life. That doesn't occur. It's all these set pieces that are assembled together to make up the final story. Now, so it comes back to this thing about probability. Do you really think this is probably a man or do you think, as I think, it's no, they've, they've put together a story that is for, for uh, religious purposes. They've put together a story that fits into the prototypes for religious stories of the time, like the healing powers, the miracle powers. The, if you look at all the other gods, then Jesus sort of begins to echo them. And so there are no bits that stick out and say, oh, that's about when Jesus went down to the tavern and just got roaring drunk one night. That doesn't happen. All the stories are scriptural requirements that fit nicely into the story, in the pattern that they build up. So I'd say the evidence for Jesus stacks up as a, a fantasy and not as a real man. And we're trying to recover something about this real man. Ken, I just wondered, I mean, where do you think Peter and Paul sit in all of this as well? And also, can I just say, by the way, that I come from a, a Jewish background, although I'm an atheist and I rejected all re religion when I was probably about eight years old. But I, I just think it's tragically ironic if the guy didn't actually exist and if he wasn't actually killed by the Jews, then we've been living 2000 plus years persecuted like nobody's business as Jews because we were supposedly the, the ones who killed him, which I think is highly ironic in a tragic sense. I'd say you hit the nail on, on the head with that. I mean, that is exactly what happened. The Jews were scapegoated by a renegade subgroup of Jews to begin with. And because of the, of the fi fiction, the, the friction between them, you also had the development of, of, of a fictional story. And the more that the Christians were able to get into power, the more they turned their wrath on the Jews. That's why the fourth gospel that came along, John's gospel, is when the is in the is in the middle of the second century when the church is really getting into its stride and it could demonize the Jews and if you know the John's gospel throughout it refers to the Jews the Jews as if Jesus and his band of men are not actually Jews themselves he's they're actually demonizing the Jews so yes that is the terrible truth for the matter absolutely absolutely you see, this is it about religion. It, make, it would make us all weep if you couldn't laugh at it because it is so terrible.
Sorry, Helen. Well, yes, I mean, um, that's the root of the problem. What was the politics? Why? Who were John, Matthew, Luke? Who paid them? Who was paying for it? Where's the money? What was the real politics? Was it just to get rid of, it wasn't just to get rid of the Jewish religion, was it? It was Romans. I mean, what's the politics basically behind it? This invention was... Sure, the... sure. I mean, OK, the Romans weren't particularly interested in religions. They weren't people who campaigned against other people's religions, with few exceptions. They embraced and, in, and, and integrated other people's religions into their own. They're, they were very smart in that sense. They just said, oh, your God that you're calling something else is like our God, so we'll call your local God the same name. And that was how they brought religions. And the Romans were tolerant of religions, as po polytheists were. You didn't go around saying, only this God works. You, you backed all of them, as, or as many as you could afford. You know, you, you backed the various gods to keep them all on your side. And, and these gods weren't so intrusive as in the way in which the Christian God later became so intrusive, taking over people's lives and telling them exactly what they should do and what, exactly what they should think. Yeah, so it's a sad and terrible story. It really is. And, and, and there's an indignation about that that's kept me going for 20 years because you think this this can't be can't you can't let this slide this terrible thing but what were the romans up to okay the jews wouldn't accept the roman power the, 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 there was a element of the jews who certainly did the temple priesthood did but there were rebels the like tax rebels you remember they always complain about tax because the jews were taxed by their own priests and then taxed by the romans and so they wanted to kick up fuss and that and that's what led to the civil war and it should be remembered the jewish rebellion was a civil war and and eventually of course the romans put a huge army in, into uh, judea and, and squash squash the jews completely now at that point what comes out of judaism but well, the answer is two things. One was a refashioned rabbinic Judaism, and secondly, various shades of Christianity. They were the things that had to replace the, the lost temple, the lost temple. So, the, so you had various innovative groups. Now, they had to make themselves acceptable to the to the Romans. The Romans had fought a very serious war with the Jews, and so they weren't too keen on Jewish radicals. So the Jewish radicals wanted to be seen as something other than Jewish radicals, you know, render unto Caesar what is Caesar sort of stuff, right? They wanted to be acceptable. So hence they could get rid of circumcision and they could get rid, rid, rid of the dietary laws. So they could become more like Romans. So it could be, you know, so this is where Christianity sort of carved a niche for itself. Not a very large one. And they, I, I often point out to people that until Constantine took over the empire, the Christians were nothing much at all. They had to have a winning, a winning general on their side before they could make any inroads. But until then, they weren't. And the world was largely polytheistic and happily so. So now, you, if you come back to this little question about but what about Peter and Paul? Well, it's interesting. Paul in particular is a special case because, of course, most Christianity really belongs to Paul or comes from Paul. He's the real author of Christianity, isn't he? You had a story. Jesus comes to earth, he appoints 12, 12 men, 12 men to have power over demons and spirits and cure the sick. But that was like version one of the plot, because it didn't work out like that. Version two of the plot has someone called Paul arrive, a zealot Jew who wants to enforce Judaism, and he decides... To well, he gets the commission. He said, it's funny, he's a young man holding coats in one, one, one chapter, and the next chapter he's then the chief prosecutor. You think, what a rocket promotion that was. And the high priest sends him off to Damascus, not even in Judea. Sends him off to Damascus to, get, to round up people. And, and, uh, and yet, of course, that story then gets this wonderful transformation because he doesn't get there uh, 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 quite in the way you expect it because he goes blind. He's blinded, isn't he? He's blinded. And, and, uh, and someone, some kindly Christian, 
leads him into Damascus and looks after him and, and so on. And he, he then is a Christian. He then starts converting people to Christianity. I mean, a sort of story that lacks all probability is so, so extraordinary. I always think it extraordinary, not so much a, a Paul on his own part, but how people like Paul, and Paul in particular, visit Jews in their own temples and he delivers them an almost an ultimatum. You believe my new God or you'll be cursed, you know, blood be on your head and the rest of it. And yet, and some of them do. Some of them, some, they give up their ancestral faith to just become a Christian, remarkably, as that might seem. I have doubts about Paul as anything real. I don't doubt that someone, well, I say I, it possibly existed as someone called Paul. I mean, you know, that is a probability, although the word possibly means humble, so maybe it's not such a big deal. So he he uh, begins with, with uh, well, his program then becomes conversion of the Gentiles. So the Jews have, have sort of, as far as Paul's concerned, he's sort of forgotten the Jews. He? He, when he perambulates around the, the Mediterranean, he, he visits Jews here, there and everywhere. But he's basically saying, you become one of mine or you're cursed and founds churches, evidently. Founds churches, although that's another implausible thing. Do you think how how readily could you go into a town, present a lecture to whoever would listen to you, and expect a few weeks, if not days later, going off, leaving a fully established church there? But that is the story that's told about Paul. None of it actually had adds um, adds up to, uh, as a coherent story. But the thing about these these biblical stories you have to read them fairly quickly to sort of uh, you, you manage to overlook all the incongruities and, and mismatches along the way because if you stop to ask you know it doesn't make sense let me just give you one about the visit to Damascus I mean the what the 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 actually the apostle says is Paul pursued them to Damascus but the apostles stayed in Jerusalem and he didn't touch the apostles in Jerusalem. Now, you just read that, it's in only one sentence, but it's there in the Acts of the Apostles. And you think, that's a strange thing to do. He's set out to persecute the, 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 the fledgling church, but the, the chief guys in, in Jerusalem where he is, he leaves alone, right? But he goes all the way off to Damascus single-handedly to capture rene renegade Christians. I mean, does that make sense? Does that have any plausibility to anyone? It's just a tale. It's just a tale of heroic. But it's almost like Superman deeds of jumping buildings in a single bound, a wave of a hand, and he gets up and this man is cured or this man's back from life. It's all fantasy. There's none of it that isn't fantasy. It's all fantasy. So coming back to your original point, what is the proof? The proof is simply the overwhelming quantity of rational arguments against silly stories. Unless you've got an ability to believe silly stories, then you cannot conclude that any of it is, is genuine. Because the whole thing is a, a mishmash of the sort of stuff that people believed 2,000 years ago, not the sort of stuff that people believe today. I hope people are a bit more wise uh, to what they will believe, but it is a, a bit of nonsense for what it's worth. <laughs> but Ken, you know, if you look at the far right in the United States and the survivalists, and this heady mix of ultra right wing Christianity with guns and with Trump and with QAnon and with the alt right and so on. You've got millions of people in that totally fractured country that are extremely dangerous and dangerous for all of us. And so, as you say, you know, people take these fables these stories, and they use them for their own ends. And those ends are 
really dangerous. I, I drove, I had the pleasure of driving through the States years ago um, to get to my university in California. And I couldn't believe the number of Bible radio stations that were spouting the most nonsensical stuff I've ever heard. And yet these people in their millions are the faithful and they're extremely dangerous. And they're likely to get Trump or DeSantos or somebody like that in, in 2024. And that will have huge implications for all of us because they're, they're climate deniers. They are going to give Ukraine to the Russians, you name it. And they're backing the most far right Israeli government to ever exist. And, and they're backing them to the hilt. So it's got terrible implications for all of us, even though we live in the UK. Sorry to go on about this, but you know, uh, it is a fable, but it's a fable that is leading to really, really dangerous situations. No, I, I think your point is well made and it has to be made. We are rational people, I hope. And, and yet it's almost like trying to hold back the tide these people don't want to discuss history, facts, reality, rationality. They want to fill the Lord. <laughs> That's what they do. They have these Pentecostal churches as big, big as a cathedral and they perform. They are fill the Lord, <laughs> you know, and you think this is the triumph of unreason. It is very dangerous. It's very dangerous. Accusing people like the Obamas and the Clintons and others of paedophilia and of eating children and the whole thing. And yet the irony is that Catholic priests are more responsible for paedophilia in many instances than anybody else. The horrors are so extensive and so far reaching, you almost don't know where to begin. Don't know where to begin. <laughs> you just can't find a nice, friendly little... Christian church who does good work. I mean, they may exist in some little Welsh village or somewhere or other, but these mainstream American organisations, well, they are, they are very much tied to the American right. You're absolutely clear about that. Yes, they are. And how do you stop it? How do you stop it? It's, it's a danger in our culture. I mean, I love to tell Americans how Europe isn't religious. We've got rid of religion, but it doesn't make any difference to them because they just think we're all, we're, well, we're all communists, aren't we? Because we have our national health service, we're all communists Absolutely. or something. It's worrying. So this is my answer to your very good question. I mean, what is the evidence for non-existence? Well, it's never going to be, well, there's the evidence and you just open it up and there it is because... If you ever had such a thing, it would be they would deny it straight away and say it's fraudulent or put there by the devil or something. But in actual fact, you cannot nail it down because you're trying to nail down an impossible thing. It's just that every single thing told about Jesus, every single thing he supposedly did, everything he, think he supposedly said is artificial. It's all artificial. It's been assembled over the course of 200 years, essentially, 200 years before they got their act together, and they're still modifying it, and modifying even the later versions of their Gospels. So, yes, and I suppose we all know Christians, and I think they're nice, some Christians, we know they're nice people, because their heart's in the right place, but unfortunately their head isn't in the right place, that's the problem. Robert, I think you're holding your hand up. The, the you, we, We've touched on what is, to me, the heart of the whole issue, um, which is that essentially humans are story believers and we're not anywhere near as rational as we think we are. In fact, rationality was never something which featured as a concept until probably the Renaissance. Before that, it was all about reasoning. Now, reasoning is not rationality. Mm -hmm. Reasoning is persuading people about things. That doesn't mean it's rational process. And the story believing goes back a very, very long way to when we were hunter-gatherers on the Sahara, uh, sorry, on, on the savannah in Africa, because storytelling was the, 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 the only real way of communicating anything. And, and it was adaptive in the sense that storytelling helped. 
humans survive in general, right? That doesn't mean all the stories were true, but it did mean that we avoided risks. And that was really important that that kind of information was passed on, generally speaking, in storytelling form, because the way our brains work is that we remember things that are stories very much better than other types of information which doesn't have an emotional kicker in it. Yeah, very good point. And I'm I'm particularly interested in religion generally, as opposed to I'm mean, as interested in the Christian religion as I am in a, in any other religion. And I'm interested in the evolution of religion. And it seems to me that we religion has been of benefit. There have been times when the concepts, particularly of love of your fellow men and the cooperation of your fellow men, have been really important for particular groups at particular times. And religion has reinforced that. There have been a lot of times when religion has just cooperate, cooperated with the biggest thug on the block um, <laughs> and the political leaders. Yeah. And religion has, 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 has managed to survive by doing both of these things. But OK, well, Robert, I, I, that's an hour or so. Oh, of, yes. OK, well, spouting on. <laughs> yeah. OK, well, uh, thank you very much. Uh, well, perhaps I'll uh, um, bring things to a close then. Um, uh, is there a brief query from Lisa we can take, or uh... Uh, is that yeah, by all means? Excuse me, I'm going to talk about it. I wanted to be reminded of how um, how they decided which gospels to keep and which ones to throw out, and why they rejected some and why they kept some. Yes, I thought yeah. that that was quite interesting but i've forgotten i've forgotten it all <laughs> <laughs> well it is a lot to try and keep in your head for sure and there were lots of gospels that's for sure you know and each group each group of christians had tended to develop their own gospel so and 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 there was quite fierce ri rivalry between the inclusion of them my own particular theory is is is, is that mark wrote his original story not as a gospel but as a story Matthew then modified it and later on Luke did the same and then John. Now they I think each in turn tried to basically replace the early one but Mark was just too current too familiar to replace and so reluctantly the church took on board all four of them despite the the contradictions and I've thought about that for a while and I realized it's actually helpful to have four versions of the truth, because if you find one version doesn't convince somebody, you can always use another version that says something different and you have that instead. So the church has got no problem with multiple Gospels in terms of at least the four of them. The others, though, were many and varied, many and varied. You had the Gnostics who wrote their own material, Valentinians, the Basilians. There's so many different factions, and uh, of course, you know, that when the church, H faction, the Catholic faction, the Orthodox faction got dominant, it tried to suppress them, and that's how it is that a lot of gospels got hidden. The ones in the in in uh, uh, Nagamani were hidden in the desert until found, you know, I think in the twenties, you know, so. The, 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 but fortuitously, we discovered more Gnostic gospel, the Gospels. Until then, we had to believe what the Catholics said they said, which was rather different from what they said themselves. But so, but now you see the church is sort of this very, very sort of malleable sort of thing that can it, it, all these things that would be fearfully critical at one stage, but now they can just go with it because how many people are worried about other Gospels right now? It goes by the by so. so yeah, you're not alone in forgetting all these weird and wacky ideas. Well, I, I, mean, I thought there was one gospel that was rejected that said that uh, Jesus magically enlarged bits of wood in his father's carpentry workshop when they were too short. You know, I thought, well, that was a miracle that, 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 that they rejected, which I yeah. thought was didn't have and quite it, the credibility. Yes, the, the one thing that um, annoyed me when I was little was, and my mum pointed this out to me when I asked her about Jesus, and um, he was always portrayed as white, often with blue eyes. 
Jesus has always been painted as white when he wouldn't have been white he would have been dark darker skinned and oh well that's a very modern view isn't it you know <laughs> we, we try and now integrate a bit of reality into the story so yes he has to be of mediterranean coloring for sure yeah. um but yeah that was never an earlier problem was it because he, he was something special <laughs> thank you okay well <laughs> Thank you very much, Ken. Good to see you again, and thank you uh, for all the uh, everybody else has attended. Thank okay. you. See you again. Bye bye now. Goodbye. Bye. Thank you, Ken.